if we're yeah let's get started yeah okay um so i'm really really excited to see, uh, be helping moderate this meeting and and Bermaji, thanks so much for the e introduction uh um between myself and, and david oyang um i'll just give a quick quick background i don't want to take too long because i just want to get to the meat of this talk but david oyang for those who don't know is a cardiologist um, with the expertise in cardiac imaging and data science. And he works at that intersection between um, kind of IT, cardiology, cardiovascular imaging, and, and computer science. And, you know, we've seen a lot of work, um, you know, over the past several years in, in uh, image processing, machine learning based image processing, and, and in cardiology that, you know, the really obvious uh, focus is, is in, in cardiac imaging and uh, assessments of ventricular function. And so, David Oyang has, has done some really exceptional uh, work in this area, and he's been published at a whole bunch of high-impact journals, Nature, JAMA Cardiology, um, Bramaji's journal, a Circulation, Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes. That's a great one as well. High impact right there. He uh, got his um, MD training at, at UCSF, did his fellowship um, in, in cardiology and uh, postdoc fellowship in computer science at Stanford. And now he's at um, Cedar Sinai. Is that, is that correct? Um, yep. In LA. Yep. And, um, and his research supported through the NIH, um, Stanford Cardiovascular Indus Institute, and industry partners. Uh, so, without further ado, um, we'll turn the floor over to David to present um, some of his work, and then hopefully have an invigorating, vigorous discussion about this. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Mike, and thank you so much, uh, Bramaji, for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here today. I know that a, a lot of the people in the audience here are really thinking about the same issues and really kind of uh, would love to get any feedback and any kind of perspectives or questions at any time. Uh, definitely, I would say that kind of this is a really exciting group and really, I think, the, the right forum for this. So please feel free to interrupt at any time. I think that oftentimes, since I'll be talking about a, a couple of threads and a couple of narratives, we'd we'll love to kind of get questions as they come up as opposed to towards the end. Sounds great. We will try our best to interrupt. I think that is that makes for the most fun of meeting. Perfect, perfect. So um, I've titled this Cardiovascular AI Development to Deployment, but in many ways it, it might be focused on cardiovascular imaging AI. The, real, the framework of this talk will be kind of discovery, uh, really a framework of why I think that imaging is particularly interesting or a unique space for the technology where it is, the development in cardiovascular, and what it looks like in detection and deployment. And I'll spend maybe a few minutes at the end talking about EKGs, depending if we have time. Um, but if we don't, I think that's definitely okay. And I think there's plenty of uh, really interesting, would love to have questions rather than go through everything. So first, regardless, this one is a cardiologist, radiologist, dermatologist, pathologist, or a variety of other medical specialists, we recognize that a picture is worth a thousand words in medicine. On the left-hand side is actually a picture from the New England Journal now 10 years ago of not actually someone with any disease, but actually a truck driver. Over the course of 20, 30 years, potentially driving the same route, potentially getting asymmetric sun exposure, you can see that the left side of his face looks very different from the right side of his face. And this is what I would describe as the, you know, there's the central dogma of biology. This is what I describe as the central dogma of medical imaging, which is that we recognize that the environment and the inheritance creates a phenotype that we really interrogate with imaging. And imaging could mean just pictures, but also ultrasounds, MRI, CTs, EKGs, but just very spark or granular kind of high dimensional data. And that ultimately we really care about the relationship to clinical outcomes. For skin, this could be skin cancer. As a cardiologist, we recognize that, you know, humans are really good at identifying the relationships. Things like ejection fraction, coronary calcium, delayed gadolin enhancement on MRIs are all things that over the course of time and over the course of rational assessment, we know that this has a relationship with the thing that we care about, clinical outcomes. But really that is just the tip of the iceberg. Similar to this picture of this gentleman, it's really the idea that, you know, there is so much more information out there that isn't fully captured in structured data. Like if you, this person saw a dermatologist, it's not like they would fully describe everything or even in our clinical charts and notes, even though there's so much information and it continues to really expand year in and year out, it's really still scratching the surface. And there's just so much more data and information in the images. 
And this is where I would say that kind of, particularly in cardiovascular imaging, and this is true of path, derm, uh, radiology, and many other fields right now, we're really seeing a boom in the application of deep learning. The real reason why I think deep learning is interesting is it's essentially an unbiased survey of that data, right? We recognize there are some relationships, obviously some of them are more important than others, uh, but this is an opportunity to really survey the whole landscape. Are there things that humans haven't found? Are there stronger relationships than what people already do? And are there ways that we can be a little bit more precise in how we adjudicate these things? In cardiovascular imaging, this kind of, I would say, goes beyond just echo or nuclear or MRI or CT. But I describe EKGs as imaging as well. It's essentially dense data that's not uh, tabularized. And also kind of on the top left, or sorry, top right, is this very seminal paper from Google uh, almost, uh, I guess now, four years ago, uh, which kind of looking at even fundoscopic images, pictures of the eye has really strong correlation with ASCVD, can pick up things like age and sex, can pick up whether one has diabetes or one's a smoker or many other information. So this is the overall thesis, which that machine learning of cardiovascular imaging provides additional prognostic and diagnostic utility. And I'll focus at least at the beginning of this talk on ultrasound, and I'll really talk about why I think that's a really good initial modality. But at its base form, it's can machines do human tasks faster or more precisely than how humans do it? And can machines do tasks that humans can't do? Can we extract additional information? Because we, I think, very much recognize that there is additional information. And I often transition at this point in the talk where I would say that kind of humans are kind of a bronze standard, where while we recognize that the diagnoses are important and this is how we treat patients, there's significant variation and there's significant variation even in the imaging, which I think that I think that, you know, people joke and call the CT like the, ray, the, the tube of truth or many other things, but there is a significant subjectivity in an assessment of imaging. And I would frame this particularly in kind of echo, which is something that I care a lot about, which is on the left-hand side is actually in two echo databases, one's at Stanford, one's at Cedars. This is actually the distribution of ejection fractions that are being reported. And it's purely colored by whether that it's a number that ends in zero and five, or it's a number that ends in kind of one, two, three, or, or four. And I would say that kind of, this is showing that there is a human predisposition to really choose an intermediate number, right? Like we really aren't, maybe aren't sure if it's a 34 or a 35 or a 36, but we'll hedge and say it's 35 and let the clinician decide whether the patient needs an ICD. Whether it's a kind of low normal or high abnormal, uh, whether kind of the EF is 50 or 45, there's a human assessment even in quantitative traits. Or, and this is actually where I highlight this is really important because this shows there's human subjectivity in a way that measurements, things like the end systolic volume and the end diastolic volume, obviously the two um, underlying numbers that caused or allows us to calculate the contraction, uh, EDF is essentially the ratio of ESV, EDV, doesn't have that relationship because people aren't biasing towards that. It has a more organic information. We know that the, the size of the heart doesn't kind of, isn't quantized, it doesn't do these stepwise functions but it's really when we get to human adjudication, when we get to human evaluation, uh, we recognize that we're fallible and we have variation. And this is despite the fact that I would say that EF is actually one of the most standardized measurements in ECHO. It's something that I think that if we think about ECHO, that's probably the one, two, and three. Obviously there's many other reasons why ECHO is important, but this is kind of the most important feature or important reason why we get ultrasounds. And yet we often don't do it at the highest standard. Blinded studies of echo have showed that there's actually human intra-observer variation to 10%. And a lot of this is just due to the fact that it's very tedious and it's really time consuming. Meaning that there are situations where we wanna trace potentially up to five consecutive beats and then average them, but in a busy clinical lab, and I would say that this is my experience talking to other echocardiographers as well as kind of our labs, we might just choose a representative beat. It's just much too hard to do some of the downstream tasks in a manual fashion, and this actually is a source of variation. Hey, David, can I, can I ask a question here? You know, um, <clears throat> so I love how you you outline that. So there's the potential for uh, AI and 
um, to, to improve precision. Uh, and then there's also maybe additional features that the human eye can't even appreciate. Mm -hmm. with, with the precision issue, you know, because we, we've done some work in the space of coronary angiography interpretation, which has a lot of overlap, right? Nobody, mm -hmm. everybody calls it a 70% blockage. Nobody says it's 72%. But one of the questions that always comes up is like, you know, we, is that level of increased precision really impactful? Uh, at the end of the day. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are about that. Like, uh, we, we oftentimes don't think it is because we've just never had the ability to measure it that precisely um, at a large scale. But what, what are your thoughts or feedback for like when people say, well, who cares if it's 52.5% uh, as long as it's like 50% or more? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good question. And I think that's definitely something that I often kind of think really kind of hard about. I would say that kind of the way clinical practice is, like you're saying, because we use 70 or 80 or whatever, a certain threshold, we don't, we are not able to be more granular. So we make a lot of decisions on the lack of granularity. But really in use cases of echo, I think that there is value if we can be more precise and more consistent. One example I often give is cardio-oncology, right? There's many times where, you know, I think that we're invoking additional fancier technologies, things like strains, things like other things, because we recognize there's variation, but there's many medical situations where we want to actually be more precise, where we want to know things earlier. And I think that this gets to the question of, at least in the echo labs I've been part of, can't say what, what's it like in Michigan or other places, where there's the idea of diagnostic inertia, right? Like that last echo said it was 55%. This time, I think it's a little bit lower, but you know, let's still say it's 55%. And bam, the next echo suddenly says 20%. You go back and look, that last echo that said 55%, you know, if you, they never had that prior echo, probably should have been a 40, should have already kind of received treatment. I think that the, the diagnostic uh, inertia is actually what's causing a lot of the variation or the lack of care or under diagnosis. Just go ahead, Romaji. Oh, no, no, I was just saying, th thanks, that's helpful. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with everything that was just said, David. And I, just to push that even a little bit further too, I was thinking, um, you know, to, to Romaji's point, I, 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 it may not be the precision, it is the, I think it's just the removal of bias that is potentially helpful. If I, if I look at an EF on an echo node and I see a 52%, I think to myself, this was an unbiased ejection fraction. You know, you see, you see a 50 or a 55, um, you, you think that um, that was a, a human interpretation. And, and one question I have for you, David, and maybe you'll get to this later on in the talk, is, um, is it, is it, um, is it, uh, you know, is, is that the, is it, I mean, certainly there's, there's bias in um, a human's evaluation of ejection fraction. Um, there's also this, um, there's a little bit of an appreciation of the clinical context. And, you know, for example, you know, if I'm going to be in, um, you know, we're going to be operating on a patient with HOCAM getting a myectomy in our cardiac ORs, you know, we'll see that ejection fraction is, it seems like it's always 70% or higher. Um, to, and, and, uh, and, 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 but any, but I'm just getting at the idea that, um, you know, removing that bias, I think, is, is good and that you, you want to have, you know, you want to preserve, you know, get the most accurate um, objective measurement, but then you are losing a little bit of the clinician expertise in kind of pushing the diagnostic diagnosis one way or the other. And sometimes it's diagnostic inertia in, in your case. Other times I think it's, it can sometimes be the opposite. You can even push towards something that uh, may need to be done in the future and you, you, you might bias in another, another direction. And, and I don't know, you know, what's the best thing, but, you, you know, there, I think a little bit of the human, you know, um, um, you know, assessment does kind of draw from a clinician's expertise and their expert judgment. I yeah, I, I very much agree with that. I would definitely say that I think um, the way I think of it, sometimes I think clinicians think of imaging the way they think of laboratory testing, right? Like if the case suddenly becomes seven, we think of the, uh, it's hemolyzed or we know to discount it. Um, but then they don't recognize that, like, when we, like you're saying, kind of, if someone's reported 45%, is that a true 45% or is that not a true 45%? Or kind of, is that 45% more meaningful in a HOCAM patient versus in just someone that's kind of run-of-the-mill kind of standard patient with a slightly low ejection fraction? I think the clinical context definitely comes first, but even with clinical context, I think that people might benefit from, I think, more precise measurements. Yeah. And I think that often, I often add this slide in right after this because people were like, well, you know, echoes, whatever, it's like a poo-poo, it's, it's a kind of bread and butter imaging, it's not necessarily the gold standard. And 
I would definitely say that kind of first and foremost in my heart, I'm an echocardiographer. So I would like to say that it's really true across all imaging, right? I think that this is actually a really great paper published last year, um, actually in Lancet Digital Health, where even cardiac MRI, um, when people are doing very simple measurements, things like measuring wall thickness, there's actually almost and just as much variation as there is an echo. It's poorly a poorly parameterized question. It's also that there is human variation because people might choose different places of the heart. People might choose it or evaluate it slightly differently. And when it's not automated, there's enough variation that actually causes even more quote unquote gold standard measurements to be to have the same amount of variation. In fact, I, I often say that it really shows that it's not the SNR or the signal to noise ratio of the imaging that's really the bottleneck of having better imaging at this point. It's really human variation in interpretation uh, that really causes the most variation in clinical adjudication right now. And this is where I think that deep learning can help. So the first paper that I kind of I'll touch on was something that we published two years ago, uh, which is really kind of integrating a lot of the really great work in CS that have been done over the last decade, uh, which is using segmentation models and deep learning models to quantify and characterize echoes and particularly for LV ejection fraction. So this doesn't touch the RV, um, but this is a way where we hope to really show that this actually provides outsized value and potentially can even be more precise than humans. And the first thing I often show is kind of even before going to any numbers is essentially this is what the model looks like in practice. This is a test set echoes that essentially the AI has never seen before. And we're asking it to trace the left ventricle. This would be a really tedious task because generally humans only trace kind of systole DAS, there's like two frames out of, this would be like 150 frames, 200 frames. But in an AI model, because it's automated, you can actually do this for every frame of the video and really you, a human eye or the visual eye can really tell more than I think numbers, whether this was a good adjudication or a poor adjudication. And the highlight here is that kind of on the left-hand side are actually, I would say good quality echoes, quality echo where many kind of traditional non-deep learning techniques would do really well in evaluating or measuring. But on the right-hand side is kind of some of the limitations with echo. There are people with challenging body habitus or potentially kind of lung disease and other things that cause kind of very naturally there to be kind of poor quality images. And that this is what the model looks like when it's a more challenging quality image. And I would say that visually as a echocardiographer, it still seems to perform quite well. Yeah, those are the types of echoes that I'm able to acquire on the right. So, <laughs> this is the uh, the the pocus or the uh, the kind of running into the cath lab echoes. That's right. The heart is moving. Excellent. Let's move. <laughs> and this speaks to kind of some of the uh, I would say the kind of benefits or uh, unique things about kind of automating software in general, right? I think I mentioned that humans wouldn't be able to trace every single frame, but because we can trace every single frame, we can also do it at scale. At uh, Stanford, we did a four beat acquisition, even in AFib or uh, even standardly, um, but oftentimes the sonographer just measures one and said like, that is actually the reference EF. But we know that kind of the kind of the filling time drastically changes the action fraction. And that because we can automate it, we can have to show that this actually allows for more precise measurement. So on the left-hand side are two patients, one in sinus and one in AFib. And then the right-hand side is essentially what the workflow looks like. So that segmentation area shows you the volume. You can see that the patient in AFib actually varies a lot beat by beat. And actually the prediction of EF actually changes a lot depending on the segmentation. And the more beats that are sampled, naturally the more precise the measurement is. This is in frame D. And this allows for a more precise measurement that ultimately the standard of care doesn't really do right now. I think mean, most busy echo labs don't, other than kind of a, a core lab or research studies, aren't able to do this at scale. And we've actually extended this uh, really to show kind of what does it mean when people trace slightly differently from one another. I mentioned in prior studies, kind of a human blinded evaluation as up to 10% variation. If you gave people the same images and just ask them to tell trace the left ventricle and excessive ejection fraction can vary up to 10%. And what we did here is actually we used the model to actually, we know when the human traced systole and diastole, but what if they traced immediately the frame before or after for systole, like about 30 milliseconds before or after, that's roughly what the, the length of each frame difference is. And what if we keep sweeping across that? 
how much does that change ejection fraction? Or we can actually do things like, what if it's just slightly foreshortened or slightly uh, smaller or slightly kind of further in or further out? And we show that this is really consistent with, I think, most what most echocardiographers know is that kind of even very small, minute changes in the tracings actually cause big changes in the ejection fraction. And this is why even for humans, it's very hard to assess kind of ejection fraction on echo. And the last piece of this is kind of, as with most machine learning uh, literature right now, um, it's really a question of, these are all retrospective data sets. This is a model that was trained on Stanford data and validated in Stanford as well as Cedars data. Um, but is there the opportunity to actually see it in deployment? I think clinical trials are actually very hard in the AI space because usually there's really not the opportunity to blind clinicians, right? I think that if you're getting a pop-up that says, uh, oh, do you, do you want to consider A or B, or do you think the number is this? You recognize that there is some uh, adjunct or decision aid that's being happening. And there is kind of, depending kind of, because it's unblinded, it's, there's really the Pygmalion effect. Do you like AI or do you not like AI? How do you actually sample the really space of performance? What we're currently doing is actually, we're hoping to perform a blinded test. So kind of, we use Singo as our pack system. And what we've actually done is actually, we've gotten sonographers to trace about 6,000 uh, studies and then remove their tracing for about 3,000 of them and actually introduce the AI tracing. And then I would say that ECHO is a uniquely great place to do a blinded study because this is the opportunity where the point of measurement is the blinded cardiologist evaluation. Are they gonna change the sonographer tracing more? Are they gonna change the AI tracing more? And this is in some ways, almost a neutered or weakened version of the AI because we wanted to blind them, because we want to blind the cardiologists. We're only going to choose the systole and diastole frame and not really kind of capture all that information, but really use our same backend workflow to really kind of highlight um, what could potentially be a more assess, uh, I guess, more precise assessment. And hopefully we'll show that it's either non-inferior or potentially cardiologists might change the LVEF assessment less when it's done by AI. So the workflow of this kind of trial that we're currently doing right now is actually we're using historical images, which is kind of done from 2019. It's about three months worth of echoes. We are actually having sonographers prospectively re-adjudicate 6,000 of them so that we actually have multiple points of reference, both the, car the cardiologists looking at the new traces from the sonographers and the new tracing by the AI, but also we have a point estimate for what was the previous clinical interpretation from 2019 and actually see how much that varies kind of cardiologists to essentially re report to report at the end. I think this offers a opportunity to both really kind of gr drill down on the sensitivity and specificity of AI, as well as what is the natural human variation when we go through the entire report. Most trials right now in ECHO, even when we're I'm referencing kind of a 10% variation, really is like 50 studies or 30 studies or 100 studies. And we're really hoping to do this at scale because we can actually use the PAC system. So this is kind of the first third of my talk. I'll probably pause here if there are any questions, but then I'll move on to the next part. It looks like Alberto has a question, but before he does, can, can I ask a quick one um, also? Uh, do you, so what, what's your vision of this? Like, you know, I, I know Rahul Dio had a great paper in circulation, um, you know, there's, there's your paper that came out. Just what, you know, cause I'm kinda, I, I have to be honest, like I, I, I don't know if I would have picked this trial design, but as you were speaking, I was like, oh, that's an interesting trial design, um, you know, for this. But I, I, what's, what do you think in five years? Is this gonna augment? Is it gonna, I mean, I, I don't know if it'll ever replace, but just kind of curious. Yeah. I, I would definitely say that I think we did a literature review of all FDA approvals. And right now the FDA, I would say is relatively lax when it comes to AI. Most trials of FDA approved AI technologies are prospective, single center, and uniformly never blinded. And I would say that I think the reason why we chose this trial approach is that we're hoping to be the first blinded study of AI in a clinical system. And I think that this, because we wanted to be blinded, we're really integrating it with the PAC system. So really from the front end, people can't see what it looks like. But, you know, I think the, the ultimate goal of something like this is that at some point, you know, I don't think this replaces anyone. The sonographers will always be there. There's definitely a 
kind of a tremendous value in getting the right images that I think that is a separate discussion. There's obviously other companies that want to do kind of more guidance and point of care ultrasound. Um, but I think that this can really streamline workflow in the sense that kind of, you know, at least at Cedars and Stanford, the sonographers get an hour to scan the patient then have to prelim the report. What if we can actually do it where they just scan the patient and, you know, that usually takes about 20 minutes and then we can streamline care or we can kind of allow people to get more echoes or we can be more precise. Alberto, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you, David. I'm really enjoying the, the presentation so far. Uh, so I, I would like to ask you about what you said that, um, you know, a few slides back when you said that the human uh, component was the biggest source of variability when, when looking at this. So how, how about the actual image acquisition, you know, uh, ultrasound mm -hmm. being so sensitive to that, right? So if you were to take the same image multiple times, it will look different every time. Uh, in the, in part due to just you know how how difficult it is with ultrasound compared to other imaging modalities to always get the same field of view, and uh, on top of that also there is like uh, patient uh, physiological state variability. So, uh, what what you know how can you justify that is indeed the human component given a certain image? If you look at it today versus tomorrow, it's going to be different versus these other aspects. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I would, I would one, fully recognize that I think echo acquisition is a really tough problem. And it's something that I think that for this study and all the other studies that I'm gonna talk about, we're using expert sonographer acquisitions. We're not using kind of point of care ultrasound and that's a, a very different topic. In fact, that's why I, I say that I think that uh, this really never will, or in my mind does not remove the sonographer from the, this workflow. I do think that like you're saying, kind of it's very easy to create off-axis images or images that um, I think to a novice eye looks about the same, but really drastically different imaging, uh, actually drastically different imaging characteristics or interpretations. That said, I would say that kind of the reason why we don't, or we think of cross-sectional imaging as a more reference standard is because people don't do test retest on those studies. Like I would say that kind of, it's kind of a little bit unconscionable to get the same CT scan on the same patient on like two separate days. Sometimes we get that a little bit of that signal in terms of uh, sometimes people got a CTP or something else uh, uh, really quickly in time. And I would say that kind of actually paper showing that is that the CAC is actually very variable across time. And similarly for MRI, the reason why I like that Lancet Digital Health paper is that that was actually one of the few papers where people did scan, rescan. And I think that really it's easy to say, oh, you know, the, it's kind of, it's, they're kind of, it looks better, it's prettier, there's more SNR so that they're better kind of imaging, imaging tests, but it is definitely one of those things that, you know, with any uh, imaging test, we show that there are pros and cons and kind of this paper, the reason why I describe this as kind of even choosing the wrong frame has a big impact is that echo actually has the highest temporal uh, resolution by almost an order of magnitude, right? Like I think of either CT and MR, the, the EF will be different. And I think that that's different because of testing characteristics. It's not, that's not different because echo is worse. It's because there's not the temporal resolution and that that actually drastically changes what the EF looks like. All right, um, if, if there are no other questions, I'll probably move on to the second part, but definitely kind of really excited and uh, definitely I think these are great questions. The second part is really, oh, sorry, Pramaji and- I Yeah, one, one, last, one last thing and I, yeah, it, you know, it, is there any, um, are you guys using this operationally at all at, at Cedars or um, do you know of anybody that's using any of these types of technologies right now? No one's using it operationally. Uh, I would say kind of even kind of among the vendors, they're very much in the, pay, uh, I think the health system acquisition part, um, but we fully integrated it and we're kind of really, I think internally discussing what, when is it fair and when is it not fair to integrate? So this is kind of what part of the, the clinical trial is to build buy-in uh, internally to be like, this is fine to deploy and then people are happy with it. Okay. So 
I think maybe this might even be a better answer to kind of Ramaji's question, which is kind of what can we do with more precise measurements or why is better phenotyping important? And then kind of the example I use is that kind of, we know that there's tremendous work being done in genetics. That's definitely an area that I'm really excited about, but I don't know very much about, but this is really following Moore's law. Really sequencing data is getting more and more prevalent. There's so much of it. And what do we do with it? Ultimately right now for most genetic studies or most actually kind of genetic, uh, essentially uh, kind of groups, their bottleneck now is no longer getting people sequenced, but it's getting people phenotyped, right? I think that um, historically people have done essentially GWAS studies on ECHO and things like that, but there's much less signal or they're not able to capture things because there's just so much variation on ECHO measurements. If your instrument or if your measurement is very variable, you won't necessarily get the signal to capture genetic results. And similarly, like things like lipids, you see such rich data because it's a really precise and accurate measurement. And we're not able to get to that point in ECHO right now. So I would say that precision phenotyping is something where I see that kind of, there's a lot of value and there's something where I'm really hoping AI can drive. And one of the things that I think is particularly interesting to me is this idea of precision medicine is both precision diagnosis and precision therapeutics. Many times kind of we're talking about, oh, we have these new targeted therapies, right? Great, Navicantin is fantastic. Tefamidus is fantastic. There's really great targeted therapies, but ultimately getting the patient to the right diagnosis and to the right therapy is actually still very hard. I think that most of these pharmaceutical companies will tell you that the patient acquisition cost is still very expensive because people overlook it and people uh, really don't necessarily think of a kind of front of mind. That's why kind of, I think pharmaceutical companies put so much effort into advertising and really kind of uh, even kind of physician education efforts. In the case of cardiac amyloid, the literature suggests that people need to see up to four specialists and between two and three years to get to that initial diagnosis. Even though I would argue a lot of these patients have a diagnosis of hep path or have gotten an echo for another reason. So it's, can we actually identify under diagnosis and identify uh, patients at scale. So this is kind of a paper that we published now two months ago, which is a two step uh, AI algorithm. The first step is actually precision measurement of the wall thickness. And we'll go downstream to really describe why I think that this is similarly more precise than human measurements. But what we've done is very similar approach that we identify key points on the myocardium and parasitic long axis and then measure the septa, measure the posterior wall, measure essentially the internal diameter, and really kind of give a very precise point estimate across the entire video. It's a very similar approach to kind of what we're doing with the ejection fraction, but this is just showing that we can do it for every single frame, and then we average this. And I would say that this is almost never done, uh, I say clinically, because most people just use one reference standard. And this ultimately becomes more precise. So on the right-hand side is actually human clinical variance uh, at Stanford. What I mean by that is actually we go use the entire ECHO database, look at the measurements and look at the prior measurement if the term no significant change was in the report. So this is actually even a, I would say a lower bound of what human variation is. It's that someone actually looked at the prior report, looked at this report and said it hasn't changed. And how much does the measurements wall thickness and diameter change between those two studies? And we kind of do the same thing on the left-hand side with an AI technology, which is both at Cedars, at Stanford, as well as Unity, so that there's an open data set from the United Kingdom of echo measurements. And we show that kind of, you can see that the splay is that essentially an AI technology allows it to be much more precise in evaluating wall thickness and wall diameters. The second piece of the algorithm is really then during texture analysis. This is the part where, you know, the, historically we know that amyloid has a slightly different texture. Just on echo, it looks a little bit different in a way that's really challenging to quantify or to really describe in words, but really visually we can tell that there's a difference. And using kind of this approach, and this is where kind of uh, we identify that we can actually create a model that is very precise and very sensitive and specific in distinguishing between HCN and amyloid and other types of hypertrophy. This is, tends to be ESRD, hypertension, and aortic stenosis. And this is kind of where kind of I, I sent out a bunch of tweets uh, a little bit ago, was that kind of our AUC is lower than some of the previous published papers, but because we're using 
negative controls of other hypertrophs and that we do the upstream evaluation of who is a hypertroph or who isn't a hypertroph, we strongly feel like this is actually a better clinical workflow and will avoid some of the problems with kind of confounding and some of the problems with confusion that can happen with simply age and sex matched controls. And similarly, we are doing this prospectively. This was actually a small set at Stanford and Sears, kind of roughly about kind of 20,000 patients. But as with any large imaging database, we can actually sweep through the entire database and call patients. What we are currently doing, and this is kind of uh, self-sponsored, this is kind of part of my startup, um, essentially we're actually sweeping through all of the echoes at Cedars and going from kind of the most recent ones, so 2021, 2020, 2019, mostly because I have a strong suspicion those are the patients who are most likely to come back or follow up or haven't unfortunately passed away. And then we're gonna create a, essentially a stack ranking of our concern or uh, threshold of risk for amyloid. And then we're gonna call the top 300 and see where that goes and see if we can actually identify underdiagnosed amyloid in this population. Of the first 100 that we've manually chart reviewed, um, you can actually see this is actually the original breakdown. This is done by uh, Lily Stern, one of the kind of star general fellows that's going to go into heart failure next year. And you can actually see that kind of roughly 12 has already deceased, but actually many of them have high suspicion on either review of their chart or have diagnosed with hep path. Uh, six were no negatives because they went to heart transplant and had some pathology. Um, and nine are actually mimics. So things like hypertrophy, uh, actually almost all of them were HCM, but actually about 50% of them were actually patients with uh, amyloid. And it, this is both in our registry. So things that we are, so the 21 were actually what we're using as a reference standard, but even 30 were actually patients that were seeing local cardiologists or just seeing the hematologists weren't previously on our radar, but even just by chart review, we can actually identify that they truly did have a diagnosis of cardiac amyloid. And so, so just so, could you go back? That's super interesting. So you basically scraped all of Cedar's echoes for like the last decade. Yep. And at this point, you've looked through 100. Um, 22 don't have any diagnosis of amyloid, and that's what you're discussing with their mm -hmm. primary cardiologist, and then you're going to sort out how many of those eventually might have amyloid? Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. That's uh, that's good. It's a good yeah. study. This is what I would say the kind of, this is the visual representation of the top 40. And you can see that kind of, we're not calling all 40 because like you're saying that many of them actually have a diagnosis. The dark green is actually what was in our records before. This is actually kind of uh, patients that are followed by Jake Patel, our MLA expert, and was in our database. In the light green, are again, the, the patients that are seen by the hematologist or seen by a PCP or kind of getting cardiac care else, elsewhere. Um, but ultimately um, we weren't be using either as a training or a reference set. And then in yellow are the ones that we're actually calling up and actually doing a PYP, doing an SPEP, UPEP. And then the ones in gray are actually the ones that have unfortunately already passed away. But we can see that a lot of them have essentially HCM, some of them, or sorry, have a half path. Some of them were AS and had really thick walls. And we know that roughly kind of one in seven on autopsy post AS or post TAVR might have amyloid as well. So all of these are actually fairly high, uh, I would say high risk or high pretest probability. Are you, David, are, are you capturing to like the reactions or like the um, feedback from like the, you know, from like a cardiologist who, you know, gets this, uh, is evaluating, you know, these, uh, these patients that have these very high uh, probabilities. I mean, it, it, I think it's interesting, you know, in a certain amount of patients will get diagnosed with amyloidosis, but it might also be interesting to see that there might be times where a cardiologist says, no, this patient doesn't have amyloidosis, but this was not a waste of my time. This was very useful because of other reasons, X, Y, and Z. Um, now I'm just interested. I've, I've thought about this with, with my own work and, and just thinking through you know, are you capturing that the, the perception of the downstream clinician who is, you know, getting, you know, these outputs and, and what they think of their, the use of their time? Yeah. It, you know, th it, that's a really great question. We haven't really systematically done that. That's something that I, I wish we were a little bit more thoughtful about doing, but we've definitely gotten the feedback where 
oh, that is actually something that they thought about, but were really deliberate not to screen for. So like there were a couple of patients with dementia or there's a couple of patients that kind of from perspective and chart review very much realistically had a very poor prognosis or low life expectancy. I think those are patients that I think were really reasonable not to screen for, but and in discussion with cardiologists, they're like, thanks for the heads up, but it's not necessarily, that might not change kind of what we do or we might kind of just stay kind of let it be. Cool. So what I was going to say, the kind of the, these are kind of the two projects I really wanted to highlight. Um, but I think that ultimately the idea and kind of some of the things that we're trying to explore now is really the question of kind of what are hidden phenotypes that are reasonable to diagnose, right? I think that we're really in a paradigm right now where AI seems to be able to find additional clues for a lot of things, uh, kind of things like uh, both an EKG or retina imaging or echo or many other imaging modality actually has a pretty strong signal for sex or has a really strong signal for age or has a bunch of other information. But is this confounding? Is this kind of some true um, uh, physiologic phenotype that people don't recognize? Or what are other things that we can do? Or how do we actually use that information is, I think, really interesting to me. Um, those are kind of separate projects, but an area where we're hoping to really flesh out a little bit more in the next kind of six to nine months. Um, but I would say that this is where um, the last piece, and I'll probably end uh, after this, is why we're also really interested in EKGs, right? Obviously kind of fantastic work done by people at Mayo, as well as kind of many others, where there's really a strong relationship with EKGs and a lot of the things that we care about. Things like undiagnosed uh, low ejection fraction, things like diabetes, things like actual potentially anemia, or even kind of, a, I would say, more mortality as well as kind of where we have a preprint on, we can actually identify underdiagnosed CKD. Um, but the reason why I think that this is really interesting is that if you think about it, similar to the retina paper, these are actually all of, if not most of the elements of the RCRI score. Uh, so actually kind of what we're actually going to pre present, and I won't talk too much about today is in kind of at HRS, we're gonna present um, some of our work, which is doing pre-op risk stratification with the EKGs and how it compares with uh, essentially the RCRI score. Um, we designed an entirely new architecture, essentially a new EKG model. And we've also validated this at Stanford as well as Columbia. And uh, since kind of this is uh, somewhat embargoed, I will skip off the results, but definitely kind of tune in in two weeks if this is something that is interesting. And this is the question where maybe I'll end with this, which is kind of how do we set expectations for AI? Right. I think that there's a lot of excitement and there's clearly a lot of potential, but there's also a lot of challenges, meaning that kind of actually on the left hand side is a really clear example in the CF literature, which is kind of this idea of super resolution. Can you get more information from low resolution images? Can you actually pair information that's high resolution with low resolution and create a model that can learn to generate high resolution images? But what ultimately happens for some of these models is actually on the in the right hand side of this image, which is kind of it actually can reproduce some of the biases of the data set. So this is a super resolution model trained on a predominantly Caucasian data set. And essentially all of the outputs, when you do super resolution on that low resolution in the middle, ends up generally becoming kind of Caucasian faces. And obviously that's really hard and it's not ideally what we want in, uh, I think, AI, but it is something that we can actually see can happen and is even more dangerous in medicine because of kind of failure modes are really important and can be quite subtle. We recognize faces better than we recognize essentially disease at times. The rare is important. Extrapolation is hard and really kind of, it really speaks to what's really important about the training data set and how we actually assess that. This is, this is fantastic, David. Um, I, I have a question, but I, I just wanna make sure you get through the, your talk to it. It's yep. about kind of the downstream implementation mm -hmm. Um, I'm getting a little bit about what Bramaji um, was uh, asking uh, maybe 20 minutes ago. But I, I'd be, before we get there, any, any questions from the audience? Then I, I can, again, I, I think, um, you know, and, and, and we, we heard this, Bramaji and, and Rahul Deo's talk too, is, is um, that, um, you know, a lot of the work in, in, in cardiology and automating 
cardiac imaging to give a high, you know, highly reliable ejection fraction or, or diagnosis is it's kind of a nice, um, um, you know, um, use case for machine learning in that it seems, at, at least from my perspective, to be more robust to issues like data set shift where, you know, you know if, if, you're, if you're training a model on EHR data and that EHR data is to some extent, you know, just a manifestation of that, of the software vendor or, the, you know, the documentation in that healthcare system, then, you, you know, you, you expose yourself to, you know, a lot of problems with generalizability. But at least with echo imaging, you know, it seems like that's, you know, and, and you focus on ejection fraction, right? It seems like that is going to be, you, you know, not something that's going to uh, have data set shift issues over, over time, at least or just less, uh, less of an issue compared to other, other, you know, applications of AI. And so it, it seems to me like this is a good example of something that um, could be implemented and, um, and, and, you know, um, and, and trusted a little bit more than, than, than other algorithms. And I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, and Karen, you've, you've talked about this a bit and, and, and you have some experience here um, in, um, you know, if this were to be implemented, you know, what, what structure would you think is, is like the minimum for having kind of an algorithm oversight and, and governance um, committee that can kind of protect against times where, you know, something, some, some, you know, some uh, shift in the data set happens that can undermine the performance of the algorithm over time or across centers. I'd love to just hear, hear your thoughts about that governance implementation structure, if, if you have a you thought about that. Yeah, no, that, that's definitely a great question. Um, I have two thoughts that I'll probably describe for this. First is that kind of the way I approach questions and implying AI is to get as close to the ground truth as possible or the raw data as possible, right? I think that structured data really has a place and is really fantastic, but already passes through that lens of human interpretation. And even something that I would say is as non-controversial and unbiased as ejection fraction, passes, if you are just training a model just on the ejection fraction, already passes through the lens of an observer. And I would say that definitely having now been to multiple hospitals, people write notes very differently, right? A, an orthopod's note is very different from a hospitalist note at hospital A versus B, where I think that some of the training, I worry generalize actually catastrophically or poorly. I think that the closer we can get to the ground truth and whatever people think is the ground truth, and this is why I focus on imaging, I think the better it gets. I think that I also have a strong opinion that it's whoever designed the models probably should be part of the team that does the implementation. You can imagine kind of some of the work that we're doing and doing things prospectively. There's a lot of wrinkles with the model and there's a lot of uh, understanding in terms of either the training sets and understanding the uh, how it was kind of designed and stuff like that, that really is really hard to fully encapsulate for people that weren't part of the model design process. Obviously there's many stakeholders and it's a, it's a big umbrella and it's a big tent, um, but it's really, I think really important that there's both clinicians, there's both technical people, but ultimately the people that really design the model have, a, I think a, a big say in how it's implemented. That's great. Yeah, so, so specifically like, I'm just trying to envision like, a decade from now, when um, this AI-based model for assessing ejection fraction, as I mentioned in the, in, the, in the first third of your talk, that becomes a you know a data element that's in the EHR. You can you, you just have the AI-generated ejection fraction, just like you get a creatinine value mm -hmm. CBC. Or, um, and, you know you know and and, there, and there's now a you're, and you're saying that, you know you know some some member from the team that designed the model should be kind of overseeing that. Who, who else do you think should be on that kind of governance committee that's, you know, potentially periodically, um, you know, overseeing this model and its performance over time? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think the, the other thing I would say is that kind of a lot of what I'm talking about is still very much in the paradigm of train once and deploy, right? I think that the, this becomes definitely much more different if you're adaptively learning or if you're actually using the, the new data or you're wanting to identify where kind of things are breaking down or things are failing. Uh, but then I always say kind of, we really don't uh, kind of, you know, I would ask Bramaji who's uh, adjudicating kind of CTFFR at uh, Michigan, right? I think it's the same thing that that's even more black box and you don't have the 
the, I think the, the opportunity to really kind of interrogate the model. I think that it is an open question. I'm not sure that this is that different from just use case of technology in a healthcare system in general. Right. I think that we, we will see that there's more and more of these technologies, but actually a lot of the times, whether it comes to nuclear cardiology technology, CTFFR technology, or many of the other things have already kind of been implemented or really clinically utilized without, I think, as uh, thoughtful of an approach. I think that uh, kind of uh, Kara Deep's work showing that kind of some of these EPIC models don't work very well is, I think, really enlightening. Um, but it is kind of mostly, I think it's a question of like, is this actually working well with our use case? Can we actually adapt it? But you know, I think my sense of that for the Epic model is that they're not interested in refining it with you guys, or will probably aren't because it's a you know it's a for-profit company. They want to kind of do their own thing. It becomes very challenging in that circumstance. Other than the binary, yes, we'll use it, or no, we won't use it. Thanks, David. Really, really insightful. Maybe, maybe, maybe Karen, do you, do you want to weigh in with with a comment, and then we can go to Mike Hughes with a question. Yeah, I'll give it quick. Um, I was going to say, I agree with David. I don't know that this actually would merit governance in the same way that some of the other models we uh, govern actually, uh, you know, kind of how this fits. Um, our, like, for example, our uh, Department of Radiology has tons of tools that they use that help them do their job, right? Like there's um, that, uh, that, that we don't govern um, because they, you know, in many instances, like the, whatever soft, wherever this gets integrated, I mean, this might be integrated into the software they use to read the echoes. This might be you know, incorporated a variety of places. At some point, if you were marketing this, it might meet the uh, it might meet the FDA bar for some level of governance uh, as a 510k, not you know, equivalency um, kind of very low bar to kind of meet for a, a software as a medical device, but. Um, in this case, it's, you know, th there's a cardiologist overread. Um, and so, uh, frankly, you know, if, if this was being implemented here, I think we, I don't know that it would meet governance for exact reasons. There's lots of other types of measurements and things. We don't govern every kind of measurement that, in, uh, that a model does. If this was being used to disrupt or change workflows, then yeah, then it could, you know, uh, that, that's where uh, I think it would, would kind of meet that bar. Yeah, very much agree with that. I think a lot of it is uh, the impact or the, uh, how autonomous the system becomes. This is really kind of uh, an aid for sonographers and cardiologists. Thanks. Maybe we'll go to Mike with a question. Yeah, thanks. Great talk, David. Uh, I guess my question is about external validation and kind of what the next paradigm might be. Cause you know, you sort of have shown pretty nice results training on one institution in the U S and testing on other institutions, you know, one single institution otherwise in the U S or in the UK. Uh, what do you think is left that's needed to, you know, vet a tool so that it could be deployed, you know, and, and help make consistent me measurements at all, uh, all sorts of different hospital settings uh, yeah. and you know what what's what's achievable say in the next five years in terms of data sharing or whatever that, that would get us to a point where we're confident in deploying a tool at you know different random hospitals especially say like non-research hospitals or something like that definitely definitely i i would definitely say that i approach it with the same bar as pharmaceutical therapeutics right i think that we need prospective studies and we need pros well-designed prospective studies and that's why I'm trying to do it both for ejection fraction as well as amyloid. Our, our papers are actually validated on multiple institutions. They tend to be kind of, you know, Columbia, Stanford, Cedars, and uh, many other collaborators. But even then, curated data sets retrospectively just aren't the same. It's really when, when you're kind of forced to do it in real time and you're forced to do it uh, prospectively where you're not tuning the model every kind of week or so or that's really, I think, the standard that a lot of these technologies should live up to if it deserves being deployed. Thanks. And if I can follow up really quick, I'm just wondering, are there specific, you know, subpopulations you might be concerned about based, that might not be well represented in the places that you've looked so far? Yeah, I think the, I would say, for, for, for example, kind of, kind of a, a common thing people describe is that, you know, TTR amyloid is well known to be, um, or kind of highly represented in African-American populations. I would definitely say that a lot of our training sets tend not to be uh, as heavily African-American just because of the 
essentially the, the patient base and the referral base? I would definitely say that those are important questions that I think governance bodies like the FDA should think about and should kind of really push to show that it works in those settings. Question from Rowan. Hey, uh, hey, David, uh, you know, excellent hey. talk and obviously a great body of work. Uh, you, I, I just have, you know, there have been a lot of excellent questions and there's one that specifically sticks around around implementation again. Uh, so the, the second half, obviously, the phenotyping stuff is very science heavy. Uh, but the first part is uh, very sec sec uh, very central to technique and technology development and lends itself specifically to technology companies. Uh, so, how, you know, as an investigator, you know, how do you sort of balance that that portfolio? Because say this, this tool is developed and it's like, say, Stanford uh, and Stanford licenses it out. How do you sort of maintain creative control over expanding it, improving it and so forth? Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a really great question. And I think that that really speaks to kind of like, where are the institutions that give you the, the freedom to explore as well as the resourcing to explore, right? I, obviously, I think that many institutions recognize this is a big opportunity. And I know that many institutions put in a lot of resources to attract talent and build data sets and kind of do, you know, I think that the male model, it seems like it's to want to kind of own it all in-house and then see what it looks like. There's other kind of uh, I would say that kind of Stanford tends to license things out, and um, especially if people are interested in doing startups. I'm not sure there's a clear uh, right or wrong, and I'm not sure there's it, it's early days to the point where kind of I think it, I'm really curious to see where things go. I think definitely kind of for both of these uh, projects, kind of they've become uh, provisional patents, and I think that the Nature Paper is now a, a true patent, uh, but it really is kind of they're kind of out marketing and shopping around and trying to figure out how they want to kind of, I would say kind of how they want to see it deployed. I think the, the vision for my guess is most people on this call as well as across the country is we do want to see or in effect patient care. The goal is not just to have a paper and kind of let it end there. Absolutely. And congratulations on all your accomplishments. This is excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank Good you. to see you. Okay. It, yeah, this has been fantastic. We're really, really inspiring and thought provoking. Um, I know it's three o'clock, so folks have to uh, rotate off here uh, this this call. I just want to say thanks again for your time and, and, and thoughts. Any any closing remarks from from you or Maji, if you have any th strong thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I just this is fantastic, David. You're really doing cutting edge stuff, and I, I do think I'm going to follow up with you. I, I'd love to. I, do, I know you've got ties to Stanford, but, um, you know, as you start to play in the sandbox and stuff, I mean, you know, generalizability and, you know, the, the real value, you know, sometimes because I love these models and how they kind of, you know, can, can, can give us new insights, but, you know, the retina example, right, T telling somebody how old they are, you could always ask them. Right, but like the discovery of like new things, like scraping um, all the echoes and finding high risk individuals. I mean, I, I think that's probably the lowest bar um, and probably the most immediate set of impacts. And I'll have to think a little bit more about the clinical trial idea because the the way that you're approaching this is really cool. It, it, it's not the tact I would have taken. The tact I would have taken would have been much more complicated and probably infeasible. Um, so, so the way that you did that, I, I think, is also really clever. So really good stuff. Thanks for coming and uh, sharing your work. Yeah, no, thank, thank you so much for the invite. And definitely, by no means am I a trialist. So definitely, if, if, <laughs> kind of, if you're interested in kind of brainstorming more, these are a lot of these design questions are, I think, open questions and would love to see kind of what other people think of uh, or how to kind of do it kind of uh, at the most rigor. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone.